back to Beyond Well with Sheila Hamilton. This is a show for people who want to learn more about their interior lives. And since the beginning of March, we've been broadcasting from our homes and our closets. We are not going to let COVID stop us. But in that spirit, we have from his living room, Dr. Jim Polo. To cope with mental health conditions since COVID-19, a lot of people have turned to prescription medication like antidepressants and benzodiazepines, and there have been reports of a 26% increase between mid-February and mid-March in the use of antidepressants, and anti-anxiety medication has also risen by 34%. Those increases were recorded in just the first month of quarantine. So you can imagine what's going on right now as more people turn more frequently to this kind of assistance during COVID living. I want to get your thoughts on this increase first, Dr. Polo, if we could. Well, you know, the first thing I'll say is that medication when it comes to depression and anxiety is is a very large, complex issue to talk about. Um, I'll share with you that uh, many years ago when I was in training, uh, so I trained in the uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. This was, this was largely before a lot of the antidepressants that are currently commonly used were even available. And, mm. and also at the time, anti-anxiety agents, although available, were not as commonly used. And the reason why I say that is because the 90s was the decade of the brain. And one of the things that happened is we started to learn more about how medications can actually help people with emotional symptoms and many new medications were actually developed. At the same time, we kind of created a culture of where people felt like there must be a pill for anything. And, and so the, the idea that if I'm feeling something, whether it's physical or emotional, people tend to think first about, well, what medication will actually treat that? Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. So, you know, just when, when I think about how my practice has evolved over years, you know, in the, in the 80s and early 90s, I didn't have people that would come in and say, hey, I'm here for medication. I had people that would come in and say, you know, I'm having trouble and I, I don't know what to do and I need help. Sure. Versus, you know, in the last couple of years, there are plenty of people that simply walk in and say, well, I'm depressed and I want to get on to a medication. Sometimes they even tell you exactly which one. Okay. The second thing I would mention about antidepressants and anti-anxiety agents, they are commonly prescribed, you know, in bulk. Um, Antidepressants have now been around quite a while that many of the newer ones are in generic, so they're relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. They don't usually rise to the top in terms of being individually expensive, but because they're prescribed to so many people, they represent a fairly significant amount of any expense budget when you're talking about, you know, how many medications are being used to treat depression, how many medications are being used to treat um, hypertension. Um, and the, the other thing then is that in our country, the grand majority of people that actually are getting antidepressants or for that matter, anti-anxiety agents are usually getting them from their primary care doc. They're not even getting them from necessarily a psychiatrist. Mm. So that creates a couple of challenges. Now, the COVID uh, pandemic has indeed increased a lot of emotional feelings for everybody. Um, the first thing I'd have to say is that Part of the challenge that we're facing as a a nation, um, and I guess globally, is there's a lot of uncertainty. Where is this going? Um, How bad will it be? Um, Will a vaccine be developed? When people are uncertain, they get anxious. Mm -hmm. Uh, When people are anxious over time and, and are dealing with stress, they can also sometimes develop kind of some depressing symptoms, particularly if they start thinking about worst case scenario. So it's not unusual that there's lots of people struggling with emotional symptoms. This is very typical of what we see with a disaster. Mm -hmm. A disaster happens. It affects many people, lots of uncertainty. People get stressed. They get emotional. And as the disaster progresses, they start to adapt. They become more resilient. You know, whatever that new normal is that they have to deal with, they, they, they do eventually adapt. So even though we've seen a, a huge increase of these prescriptions going out, I, I think what we will find is that at the same time that a lot of people are struggling with some symptoms of anxiety and depression, we're also going to see some people that will begin to develop, you know, resilience and be able to adapt. It doesn't necessarily mean that we'll be happy with how things are unfolding. And it doesn't necessarily mean that all those symptoms are going to go away. Sure. But 
people will in general be able to to handle it now there obviously will be some people that cannot and so that's where it really becomes important to making sure that for folks that are struggling where medications can make a difference that we make sure that that's available so jim i have two questions one is the potential harm of getting these kinds of medications through a general practitioner because antidepressants as you well know are really fantastic for people with depression but can be extremely harmful for people with bipolar disorder And secondly, how do you make sure you're being carefully monitored closely enough so that if you are a person who's having an extreme reaction, somebody can know what to do, what to watch for, and what reactions are the most dangerous? All right. So uh, two very good questions. Let's tackle the first one. And and let me just kind of reflect back what I heard, make sure I've got the question correct. The, The first question I heard is, hey, what's the real differences between potentially getting a medication from a primary care doc versus a psychiatrist in terms of making sure that the medication is actually going to help the individual, not potentially harm them? The example you used is giving antidepressants to somebody that maybe has bipolar. Right. Okay, that's a great question. So first of all, a little context for our listeners. When people have bipolar disorder, they go through periods where they have significant depression And while they are depressed, that period of time doesn't look very different from somebody that has clean major depression. But the reason why it matters is because people with bipolar, if you give them certain antidepressants, you actually make them much worse. You don't help them. So the the bottom line is that when you have folks that have some depressive symptoms, the actual diagnosis can make a difference so that you can select the right medication. Okay. Now with that in mind, the first thing I'd have to say is that many of our primary care providers, uh, which tend to be either family practitioners or internists um, that provide care to adults and then pediatricians who provide care to children. First of all, they do have pretty good solid knowledge about understanding the basics of emotional and behavioral health. And we have gone overboard um, as a medical, you know, system to help them understand critical principles about how you first of all diagnose and and then when you have a diagnosis when is it reasonable to take certain steps in terms of treatment to include medication versus when is it complex enough that you should consider referring to somebody else Mm. now now the reason why that's important is one of the things that that is kind of distinctly different about diagnoses in mental health is we have created a lexicon, a, a, a manual, if you will, it's called the DSM-5, that lists sets of symptoms that allow you to think about what the diagnosis is. Because remember, the diagnosis is mainly so that we can figure out how we're going to treat somebody. So I'll give you a very simple example. I can have two people that are depressed, and one is sleeping all the time, and one is not sleeping at all, but yet they have the same diagnosis. Mm. So for the individual that is sleeping all the time, I'm gonna select an antidepressant that is activating, gives them more energy. For the individual that is depressed, but not sleeping at all, I'm gonna give them a sedating antidepressant that's Mm. actually gonna help them sleep. But the diagnosis is technically the same because we've created the symptoms of it. So that's why medication becomes very, very important. Now, what I will say is that one of the blessings of antidepressants is that most all of the newer antidepressants that have been developed are really relatively safe. Um, It's very hard to kill yourself uh, with the newer antidepressants. Uh, And the reason why I say that is because the media in the past has talked about how some antidepressants may actually increase suicidality. And while that may be kind of true. It's probably not how it works chemically. I mean, antidepressants improve your, your, your feelings and your mood sometimes quicker than you're able to understand. So your body is feeling better mm. and you have more energy before you really understand why you're feeling better. And so if you're feeling better and your body's got more energy, but you're still depressed about what happens now, potentially you have more energy to actually take action of which sometimes that action is is suicide okay so it's very complex but the bottom line is many of the antidepressants are actually quite safe um and they're all 
based on treating certain sets of symptoms so that there are some antidepressants that are better to use for somebody who has an anxious depression versus other antidepressants that might be better for somebody who has more of a melancholic depression. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. So for that second question, how do you monitor and make sure that you're on the right thing? So let me explain, first of all, why that is such an important question. Antidepressants don't change the way that we think. They don't make you happy about something that you shouldn't be happy about. I mean, if you're depressed because you lost a a close loved one that is very close to you and you're going through depression, an antidepressant is not going to make you happy that they're gone. Okay, so so the first thing that is important to understand is antidepressants help with all those symptoms that come along with depression so that you can then deal with what's ever going on. So let me give you a couple examples. Let's say I'm depressed because of something that happened in my life and and the symptoms that I'm having that are beyond just those emotional feelings of sadness. I have lack of motivation. I have lack of energy. I'm not sleeping. My appetite has changed. I'm restless. um, I have a shorter temper. I get irritable easy. Those are the symptoms that the antidepressant actually help. And if my body feels better, I have more energy, I have more motivation, I'm sleeping better, I'm now able to handle whatever it was that led to the depression. And very often what really helps is the counseling part, working through and understanding why whatever happened was, you know, depressing. Now, here's the reason why that then becomes so important. Medication selection, first of all, is about what are the symptoms that we're truly trying to target? Which antidepressant is going to be the right one for the right person based on their symptoms? And that's why we have so many different antidepressants. It's not like any one antidepressant is better than the others. Right. It depends on each individual. Now, when it comes to side effects, keep in mind that the way antidepressants are working is we're trying to actually affect some of the symptoms that you already have. And by default, most antidepressants create side effects in the, in the background. So let me give you an example of that. Uh, I'll, I'll just use um, Prozac as an example, just because many folks are, are very well aware of, of Prozac. It's been around for a long time. It's a once a day medication. It is a fairly uh, safe, very safe medication to use. It's a long half-life. It tends to be what we say is an activating antidepressant. It gives people a little bit more energy, gives people a little bit more focus, and it works over a long period of time. Well, some people will have the side effect of feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit uptight. I feel like I have a lot of energy. I feel like I have too much energy. Well, that's a side effect of medicine. That is, oh, by the way, a side effect that in some people we actually take advantage of. So it is important, first of all, when you're prescribing an antidepressant, doesn't matter whether you're a psychiatrist or a family practitioner, explaining to people, hey, this medication, these are the symptoms we're targeting. This is what we're trying to help with. And oh, by the way, these are the symptoms that you may experience as a side effect. Yeah. Most of us will adapt to the side effects. So I often will tell my patients, listen, you may notice early on you're having a little bit of nausea. That's okay. Actually, that means the medicine's actually getting into you. Mm -hmm. You will probably adapt and you will probably adjust in such a way that it doesn't become, you know, significant. But if it does, I'm going to be very willing to track this with you and we'll change if we need to change. Yeah. So part of the thing is just reassuring folks. First of all, they don't need to be afraid of symptoms, but they do need to disclose them so that you can actually think about, well, is this the right medicine for you? Is it the right dose? Maybe it's, sure. the dose just needs to be lowered. There was a line of thinking for some time that antidepressants work when the chemicals in the brain stop working. But then I've done a lot of reading that suggests that was a total misunderstanding of how antidepressants work. And in many ways, we really do not know for certain why it is antidepressants work or what it is that they're doing in the brain. Is that your understanding as well, Dr. Polo? Yeah, Sheila, you're, you're, you're on track. Um, we, we know very much of the how antidepressants work. We actually don't really understand the why. Let me tell you why I say it that way. Antidepressants do affect, essentially, um, at the cellular level, neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. They, 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 They do that in a variety of different ways. First of all, we have many different neurotransmitters that are part of our brain. And neurotransmitters 
basically allow the movement of, uh, of signal, of energy from one neural cell to another neural cell. And it affects both the amount of information as well as the speed of information that maybe goes between two neural cells. Antidepressants work at that level. They can increase availability. They can decrease availability of, of very specific neurotransmitters. So we know that is how they work. We don't know why necessarily, though, they actually work because we don't always know exactly where within the brain emotion resides. Mm. Um, we, we have tremendous knowledge uh, about how the brain functions to maintain our physical activities, you know, what areas of the brain control movement, what areas of the brain control speech, what areas of the brain control feeling, um, at, at physical feeling, uh, what I'm referring to we're still a little bit in the dark of how you understand feelings from an emotional perspective. So although we know transmitters can improve mood, we're not really clear on the how and why that happens. The other thing is it's, it's not universal for everybody. Okay. So I could have two patients theoretically that will present being very depressed and their symptoms may be very, very similar similar enough that I would select the same medication for both. And yet one might experience improvement and the other might not. So, so we don't always know the why some of the antidepressants work. And we're not convinced that antidepressants are actually affecting the true cause of why we have emotional feelings. We know that they do affect some of the cellular uh, neurotransmitters. Are there neurotransmitters or any transmitters in the gut? Since so many people describe their anxiety and depression as coming from the stomach. So, you know, what's important to understand is remember that the brain is like the master organ that really controls all bodily function. And some of the bodily functions that the brain controls, controls it without our real, you know, knowledge and without our real awareness in the moment. So, for example, we all breathe. We breathe in, we breathe out. Our body does that, but we rarely actually spend time thinking about breathing. It just happens. That's controlled by the brainstem. And in fact, if you purposely stop breathing, you will all of a sudden gasp for air because yeah. you have to, okay? So there are many functions like that that the body is doing without active awareness. One of those is digestion. So digestion happens in our body. You eat food. Food goes into your stomach and you know it goes through all the intestines and all kinds of, you know, digestive juices get secreted and it slowly, you know, digests that. Now all that food becomes nutrients and energy uh, for your body to use. But we don't actually have awareness of how that occurs. The reason why that's important is because we've been able to demonstrate and understand that clearly how you're feeling, your emotions, your anxiety, your overall kind of... Um, a feeling does affect bodily functions. So we oh, know yeah. when people are anxious, their muscles get tense. We know yeah. when people are anxious and, and upset and uptight, they tend to not want to eat. You know, there's a fight or flight mechanism that kind of prepares your body because you might have to act. Sure. So there's a very high correlation between how we're feeling and then how our body is functioning. Dr. Polo, I could talk to you for hours. In another show, I hope you'll be willing to dig deeper into the use of antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds. This is Beyond Well. If you like what you hear, please give us a thumbs up wherever you listen to your podcasts. Make it a great day.